Hi, Jim. Hi, how are you, June? I'm great. How are you? Okay. Um, I'll go ahead and start them with the introduction since I can't get my tabs to work, but I can see you, so that's great. And I do see your pins, by the way. Um, right. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Tonight, I have an extra, extra special guest for you. Our, our guest is June Monroe from Las Vegas, Nevada. She is a Clark County Asian American Pacific Islander community commissioner, a living kidney donor, an educator, an advocate for the NKF and Donate Life, and the author of a children's book called A Little Yellow Cap. My friend June is quite an adventurer. She has traveled the world. She's been skydiving, won numerous awards for her swimming at the Transplant Games of America. And one of my favorite photographs of her, uh, I once saw a, a, a photograph of June. Let me bring that up if I can. <laughs> there it is. There a photograph of her on a camel by the pyramids in Egypt. So my, my friend gets around. Um, professionally, she's also a very, very busy woman. She is an elementary school assistant principal. Wow, what a job that must be. A published children's book author and a dedicated voice for kidney health advocacy through the National Kidney Foundation. Her kidney story is particularly compelling. June's brother, Brian, whose kidney originally failed in the 80s when June was about 12. Mm -hmm. um, her father donated a kidney preemptively to Brian. About 20 years later, that kidney failed and Brian went on dialysis for two years. On March 9th, 2005, June donated a kidney to Brian. Thank you, June. June is a first-class kidney advocate. Quote, many legislators don't know about kidney disease, so it's essential to educate them in order to pass legislation that supports the kidney community. Educating legislators and getting their votes is one of the most important things for the community. Please give a warm welcome to one of the most active kidney advocates in America. Miss June Monroe is here with us tonight. June, how you doing? Good. Thank you for having me, Jim. I'm oh, honored. no worries. Did, did, I, did I state everything in the introduction correctly? Yes. It sounded wonderful. Yes. And Brian okay. was on dialysis. About two years. I don't know the exact amount of time, but it was about two years. About two years. Okay. Tell us a little bit about where you grew up, your education, and your employment history. So I was born in the Oak Knoll Naval Hospital in Oakland, California. My dad was in the Navy, and he's a Vietnam veteran. And we ended up moving to Texas. So I actually grew up in Texas. My dad was a geologist and got a job in the oil industry. And so I grew up there and that is where Brian's kidneys failed. Brian was born in Texas. His kids, kidneys failed. Um, like you had said, I was about 12. He was about 10 years old. And the doctors have no idea why his kidneys failed. There is no family history of kidney failure. They had no idea. And, but they did fail. And what my mom, I don't remember this, but my mom said what had started happening was Brian was having constant bloody noses. And so she took him to the hospital and that is how they found out it was related to his kidney failure. And so, again, we were kids. My dad ended up donating at the time in Texas. I don't know which hospital, um, but I do know that the donation took place in Texas. And um, that kidney that, you know, that my brother had for my father lasted for, for several years. So Brian was able to, you know, live 
live life without being on dialysis and um, continuing school. And eventually that kidney did fail and Brian did go on dialysis. And I was living in Los Angeles, California at the time. I was teaching middle school, I believe it was at the time. And uh, Brian, when, when a transplant happened, um, I did teach elementary and middle school while I was in California. But when his, um, my dad's kidney failed that Brian had received, Brian did go on dialysis like you had mentioned for, for a couple of years. And my mother was tested. She could not donate because she had heart issues. My sister was not able to donate because she had high blood pressure. And I was a perfect match. The doctors said that Brian and I, we matched so closely that we could have been twins. That's how good of a match we were. And so um, our donation was, um, our transplant took place at UCLA and, um, March 9th, 2005. And, um, I stayed, I think it was one night in the hospital and from the donation, you know, I was initially nervous, of course, and scared. It's a major surgery, but I know that my dad had done it before and I had seen my dad, you know, lived a productive life. And, um, so, um, but the donation, I think made me feel like I was invincible, which was a huge error on my part of, you know, thinking, oh, wow, I sur survived this, you know, major surgery. And, you know, I just kind of thought I was Wonder Woman and started doing all of these uh, things like skydiving and bungee jumping and uh, started getting myself in trouble. Um, uh, I shouldn't say in trouble, but so I went bodyboarding afterwards for the first time. I ended up popping my back. Um, when I went skydiving, the the strap that goes across your chest actually ended up choking me midair. Um, so I started doing all of these things and like you said, traveling as well. Um, and then, you know, just creating a bucket list for myself and, you know, writing a book was one of them. It, it's not about the money or the fame. It, it's just the accomplishment of actually writing a book. And it's, like you said, it's called a little yellow cap and like a bottle cap. And it's basically, it's a children's book uh, for elementary level, kindergarten through, I would say, even fifth grade, where it teaches about not littering, uh, protecting the environment and recycling. And um, I was actually working on a different book at the time. And I was teaching elementary school and I was struggling finding a book about litter, littering and recycling for my second graders. And so I was like, okay, well, I guess I need to write a book about it. And so that's kind of how that came about. And, um, and you said my education. So I, most of my, um, you know, when I was a child, I grew up, like I had mentioned in Texas, and then I graduated from high school here in Las Vegas, Nevada. I attended community college. I then ended up um, moving to Japan for a couple of years um, to be with my mom. Uh, my mom did move there for a while. Um, and then she's, she's back here in the States now, but, um, and I, because I, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. So after li living in Japan for a couple of years, I came back, I attended community college in California, and then I transferred to the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And when I was in high school here in Las Vegas, I actually got the acting bug because I was in theater. So I moved to, after high school, um, I did move to Japan, um, to, um, excuse me, after high school, I did move to Japan after a couple of years of, of college, but I did move to Los Angeles after I received my teaching credential at UNLV here in Las Vegas. 
and I wanted to pursue acting. So I moved to Los Angeles. I worked as a background actor for in different movie and TV shows and had a lot of fun doing that. But, you know, unless you make it big, you know, that it's, it's a struggle financially. So, um, I started working on my master's degree and my, uh, you know, I have family and friends here in Las Vegas. And so I ended up coming back here after, uh, soon after the transplant, um, took place when I was in Los Angeles and, and moved back and, uh, was teaching. And, you know, one of my aspirations was to go into administration, become an assistant principal. And that was on my bucket list. And I have achieved that now. And, um, you said, uh, childhood education and what was the employment history employment history so you have a little bit of that with the background acting and the movies and in tv that was fun um a uh, majority of my career has been in education and um i've taught for over too many years and uh, I've been an assistant principal for a year now. And a big adjustment, a big change. Um, and um, yeah, so that's where I'm at now. And we're on spring break and there's no students or teachers at the school. So we're, I'm still working. Our, our spring break is only, I only get one day off for spring break. I don't get one week like the teachers and students do. So <laughs> I, I'm working. <laughs> Okay. Um, just to, in reference to setting a time frame, what is your date of birth, June? May 13th, 1972. Ooh, the year I graduated from high school. <laughs> that I tell you how old I am. <laughs> Talk to us a little bit about your work with the Clark County Asian American Pacific Islander community. I've not so had experience with that on the broadcast before. So growing up in Texas, so I'm biracial. My mom is Japanese. My father is Caucasian. And growing up in Texas, there were, you know, I was definitely a minority and there were not a lot of Asian, um, you know, people around. And I, I did struggle um, with, I guess, identity, you could say. And I think moving to Japan and living with my mom for a couple of years and visiting Japan, it made me more confident in being Asian and being a minority in the United States. And so, um, you know, uh, especially with the language barrier, I've seen my mom struggle with the language barrier and, um, you know, speaking up for people who who need a voice, not only with like, for example, with the National Kidney Foundation, but the AAPI community as well. And so I feel like I represent my mother and a lot of the AAPI community who don't have a voice or who who struggle with the language barrier. Um, and, you know, a lot of the culture um in some of the Asian communities, you know, is, is not to be vocal. And so there, I, I don't remember how I saw that there was an opening, but basically there's an application process um, to, for, to be um, a Clark County AAPI uh, community commissioner. And so I wanted to get involved and we meet on a monthly basis. It's a two year commitment. And basically, we are here to support the AAPI community in Clark County. And we, like I said, we have monthly meetings. We do have guest speakers at our meetings. And we did have a town hall earlier. And then also in April, we're going to have a resource fair. And so meeting other AAPI um you know, people in the community um, and just um, having the, the experience, I think, is it's been a, a great experience for me. 
Okay. Let's talk a little bit about your experience with uh, kidney disease. I understand that your brother Brian had kidney disease, and we don't really know what caused it. Can, can you tell me approximately when he was diagnosed? Again, it was when we were children, sometime in the 80s. So uh, he was about 10 years old. I don't know the exact age or year, <clears throat> but <clears throat> again, it was when we were kids and um, we were about that age and it was in the 80s. Okay. And your father donated a kidney to him preemptively, mm -hmm. meaning before dialysis around the time that you were approximately 12 years old. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And Brian was not on dialysis before the transplant. Correct. Okay. Were there any complications or issues for either your father or Brian after the transplant? I don't recall exactly when I, I, I'm, I think it was after the transplant. I think my dad and I think both of them had um, kidney stones. I know one of them did. I don't remember if it was both of them, but I remember actually taking the kidney stones to my school as like a show and tell. And, um, but I know that the kidney stones and then um, Brian, he was very active in sports when we were kids. He did baseball, football, but after the transplant, um, I, you know, to protect that remaining, uh, he stopped playing those sports and, um, let's see, um, Brian did have a lot of medical issues, not just his kidney. Uh, he did have some heart issues. These came later after the transplant. And as you know, the medicine can, can impact you as well. He had um, a migraine and I, I don't know what caused the migraines. Uh, he did actually have surgery. The surgery did not help. So he was taking pain medications. So he, he struggled quite a bit with his health over the years. So, um, and um, you know, like I had mentioned, my dad's kidney did fail that Brian received. And so Brian did end up going on um, dialysis for a couple of years. And then I donated to him. Okay. I, I understand from the things that I've read that Brian's transplanted kidney lasted approximately 20 years. And then he was on dialysis for a period of two years. Is that a fair statement? I, I don't know the exact years and dates, but th that that's about, like I mentioned, he, the, my dad trans, the transplant with my dad was in the eighties. And then, um, you know, around the 2000, um, cause I donated March 9th, 2005. So the early right. 2000 when, so, um, Okay. Talk to us a, a little bit about the decision that you made to donate to your brother. What, what motivated you to donate a live kidney to Brian? I'd say most uh, probably because of my father, because I saw that my dad donated. And so I knew by seeing him do that and survive that but, you know, and then also, of course, you know, saving this is a family member, a loved one. And, you know, um, so it's something that, you know, is like this is a loved one. They need a kidney. So, you know, we need to get tested and find out. And so there were there were several factors. Um, but I think, again, seeing my dad go through it when we were kids I saw that, okay, you know, this is something that's possible and um, doesn't mean it, you know, I wasn't worried or concerned, of course, but um, that did help me, me in making the decision. And then also, you know, 
saving a family member's life. And um, those were my main factors. Okay. Talk to us a little bit about what the testing and preparation to donate a kidney to Brian was like for you. What kinds so of things happened? <laughs> I apologize. It happened so long ago. I don't remember a lot of it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, and, you know, I don't even, I'm assuming like blood tests, urine tests. Um, I know that there were labs involved because they had to make sure that we were a match. Um, but again, it was, it was so long. I don't even remember a lot of it. Um, okay. So I guess that's a good thing, right? <laughs> no, no, no. That's, that's all right. They probably did some things to check your heart, right? Mm -hmm. they, they, they probably had you walk on a, one of those uh, runway type things and the things they did to your uncle Jim before they transplanted him. So I'm guessing that yeah. it's substantially similar. Yeah, I don't, um, like I said, I, but they do have to make sure that you're healthy enough to donate. And right. you know there are a lot of tests involved. So they did have to make sure that I was healthy and there were a lot of tests that were done. Okay. Now, mm -hmm. you mentioned to us that you donated to Brian on March 9th, uh, 2005, and you said that the transplant took place at UCLA uh, Kidney Transplant Medical, correct? Yes. Okay. What was your experience like that day? What do you recall yeah. about that? So, um, I only stayed, I think it was the one night. And it, it was, I, I do have to say it was, um, it was painful, um, you know, and, you know, I felt looking back on it that maybe one night wasn't enough. I did struggle walking, you know, after the surgery, like walking into the parking lot and I was in a lot of pain. It was a laparoscopic. And I have to say the doctor, and I don't even remember his name, did an amazing job. Um, I know that they do different types of whether it's laparoscopic or, you know, through the side. My dad did not have a lapros laparoscopic, so he does have a large scar. Um, mine, the doctor did such an amazing job. So my line is probably about this big. And it's at the, um, um, the, my pubic line. So right where the, the line is, where, um, though you can't even really mm -hmm. see the, the scar. And I do have a couple of, you know, couple of scars on my side where they inserted the camera, I guess, and a tool where they insert in the side, but just little, little tiny um, scars on my side, but the, the, like I said, where they removed the kid kidney was actually from the front of my body where my, um, pubic line is. And, you know, it's, it's just a little bitty about this big. And like I said, you can barely see it. And I know a lot of people have different scarring, um, depending on how the doctor removed it, but my doctor did an amazing job. Um, and that's one reason why I, I specifically selected UCLA because I knew they had a good reputation for trans kidney transplants. And, um, you know, I lived in LA at the time and, um, uh, the recovery, um, you know, they do require that both the recipient and the donor have a, um, you know, a caretaker that is crucial and it's critical. And I felt like, you know, I've been healthy and, you know, I hadn't, um, I felt like, oh, I'm fine. I won't need, you know, need that. And so I was trying to be independent and, um, realize that, no, you, you do need a caretaker. Um, you know, and you do have to, at, at my hospital, we, we had to list a caretaker and I believe it was my mom. I can't recall. Um, but I felt, I thought before the surgery, I wouldn't need one because I, I don't know, but I, I did. And it is, 
it is critical. Also, I don't remember exactly how long I took off of work. I was teaching at the time of the surgery. I was teaching middle school. And um, I do believe, I think it depends on your job, um, on how much time you should take off of work. So teaching is pretty demanding. Um, you know, if you're, if you're sitting at a desk, that's going to be different than someone who does construction work or, you know, mm -hmm. um, but it, it teaching, you know, I'm not sitting at my desk, you're walking around, you're, you're in the classroom. And, um, I actually had to lean against the wall in the front of the classroom to hold myself up because I still did not feel I was not recovered enough, uh, to go back to work. So I, I should have taken more time off. Um, but you know, like now you can see, you know, I've, there's a picture of me swimming, uh, one of my friends who is a kidney <laughs> recipient, Dinora. She is a, um, kidney recipient here in Las Vegas. And a friend of mine, she took that picture of me at the transplant games of America. Um, I've traveled, I've, you know, done my, a lot of items on my bucket list. So, um, clearly I can walk and, you know, I've, I actually completed, I've completed a marathon before the transplant. And I also completed a marathon after the transplant. Um, so that's another big bucket list item. So, um, I've recovered, obviously. Um, I do, there are some things that I do need to make sure that I, you know, maintain the health of my remaining kidney. Like I do need to make sure that I drink water. Um, I've noticed if I don't hydrate, my kidney function does fluctuate. And so I do need to make sure that I'm, um, you know, drinking water. And also I have, you know, had to uh, think about protein, sodium, and potassium, things that I didn't think about before the transplant, you know, I basically ate whatever I wanted. And um, now I'm more conscious of those things. And so, um, and it's been, it's been a while since I donated. So, you know, as we age, our function does decline. So, um, so those are things that I do um, look at to um, make sure that, you know, I keep my function up and I'll give you an example was I was making smoothies every day and I was putting a banana in the smoothie every single day. <clears throat> and my labs, I do see a nephrologist once a year to check my kidney and my health. Um, and my, um, the, is it the phosphorus? the bananas the, okay my phosphorus was high and we figured out it was because i was eating a banana every day so i can still eat bananas just not every day because i was overdoing it just like everything moderation is key and i was not doing it in moderation so then i switched to oranges not knowing that oranges are also high in phosphorus <laughs> because i had never really been on a restricted diet before, you know, and, or was concerned about these things. So then I started uh, having, putting oranges in my smoothie and found out, oh, well, oranges are also high in phosphorus. So I, and so my nephrologist Potassium. told me, huh? Potassium. Oh, is it Oranges potassium? are high in potassium. Okay. I'm, I'm <laughs> yes, <thinking>. ma'am. <laughs> So potassium, not phosphorus, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'm yes, sorry. I know it's Absolutely. a word, but I can't remember which one. But No, it's okay. Um, it's, it's one of those key words. Yes. And so my nephrologist told me the best thing to eat is an apple. If I'm going to have fruit, the a apple is the best. And so... I still eat bananas and oranges, just not every day. And then, you know, even protein, um, just cutting back on the red meat. You know, I still eat red meat. I still eat protein and eat meat, but just not every day. Again, it's in moderation. So, right. I'm mm -hmm. going to show the folks a picture, June. Okay. I think. <laughs> yep. There you are. I see it. 
we're, we're, we're doing a little swimming and we've got notes on our, our back. And I understand you're quite a good swimmer. Oh, thank you. Well, I don't know about that, but I, I did grow up when we lived in Texas in our neighborhood, we had a pool and we competed against other neighborhoods. So I was on a swim team in Texas and I grew up on a swim team and my favorite stroke is the breaststroke. And so this past summer, the transplant games was in San Diego and I won six medals for the state of Nevada. I won four gold and two silver. And then my, the, uh, the first transplant I took, um, transplant games I took place in was in Salt Lake City. I think that was in 2018. And I forget how many medals I won for that. But um, yeah, it's it's fun. And, you know, it's more about camaraderie and meeting other people um, in the community around the nation. And it's it's great fun. Okay. So your health has been well since you donated a kidney. Have, have you had any issues or complications since your donation? So like I had mentioned, like the diet I've had to watch because um, the like the protein and then I forget if it's the phosphorus or um, pota phosphorus, right? Um, with yeah. the bananas. So, um, you know, watching my diet a little bit and then also like if I'm dehydrated, the fluctuation of my kidney function. Um, so just making sure that I'm staying hydrated. And then, of course, you know, um, exercise is really important. So um, before I, you know, became an assistant principal, my main exercise was just walking around the neighborhood. Um, and, you know, I have a couple of friends that I would sometimes walk with, but this past year, I haven't done it as much. Um, and I used to hike quite a bit as well. Um, but my goal is to, I need to start getting into exercising more on a regular basis and getting back outside and walking around the neighborhood. Um, and, you know, I enjoy kayaking. I haven't done that in a while. Um, so just just getting back out there and making sure exercise is priority. Okay. You, you mm -hmm. mentioned to us about the skydiving and the bungee jumping. Um, and I, I know you've been on a cruise, right? Yes. Uh huh. Done some traveling on a cruise. One of the things that uh, caught my eye in, in your resume of, of uh, your bucket list, so to speak, is that you went to see the Bean in Chicago with a bunch of other kidney patients. Can you tell us what that experience was like? Chicago is oh, about 20 minutes from my house. That's why I asked. Oh, wow. Okay. So it was, I think it was 2018, April 2018. Um, a living donor, um, it was, a, I guess, like two or three living donors, um, got together and I guess decided they wanted to try to break the, uh, or set a Guinness world record of the most living donors in one location. And so the site was Chicago, Illinois at the bean, which is the millennium cloud. I think it's called millennium cloud park. Um, it looks in, it's shaped like a kidney. So it right. is a clap, but it's, it's the shape of a kidney. And, you know, here's, I've got the kidney shape here. And, there you go. and so th that is why I believe that they selected that location as our meeting point. And so there were people from all over the United States and even people um, internationally who met there to set the Guinness world record of the most living donors in one location. And I believe it was either for the final count was either 409 or 410 living donors that, you know, we had to bring paperwork. So I had to contact UCLA and, you know, get paperwork to prove that we were living donors. And, um, we, we met there and, um, you know, a lot of people, you know, the, you know, the jewelry store Tiffany's. 
So there's a yes. jewelry store, Tiffany's close to the bean or somewhere in Illinois, where a lot of the donors um, went and they actually have the, it's the Millennium Cloud jewelry, um, like a necklace. And so a lot of the people purchased the necklace because it does look like a kidney. And um, even I know a lot of people who didn't even attend who have purchased the necklace from Tiffany's. I have not purchased it myself. Um, I don't really wear much jewelry other than these wonderful pins. Uh, but um, so it was a lot of fun. And we did set we did set a Guinness world record. So that was pretty cool. And it's, it's, it, it's available online to view. I think it's still available. Um, but yeah, that was really cool experience and, you know, make some friends from it and, um, yeah, great experience. So I also helped set a Guinness world record as a bucket list item. Awesome. Just awesome. You, you mentioned that you won several medals at the transplant games. Were they all in swimming or were they for other things? They were all for swimming. Um, so I was not able to attend um, the entire transplant games. It's, it's held over several days. And due to work, I am only able to stay, you know, like a couple days. Um, but swimming is my area. Um, whereas like some of the other things like darts and... Um, there's running track and field. Um, those aren't really my areas. And I, I wasn't there for those days anyway. So, but, um, I felt like, okay, I can contribute to the swimming and partake in that. And so they were all in swimming. All of my medals were in swimming. Okay. You mentioned that you had written a children's book, uh, a, a little yellow cap because, um, you, you had difficulty finding, books about the environment for your youngsters to read at school. Um, yeah. Just so folks know, in the comments to the original broadcast of, of this show, um, I put all kinds of links about June. So if you want to drill down a, a little bit on what's going on with our friend, including her book, you can do that. And that includes where you can purchase the book too. So um don't you know if you, you have children at home you you might give a second thought to uh trying to raise some awareness for the environment uh, through our friend june's book so and thank that you. information is available to you and i i thank you june for writing such a book uh, to try and uh, discuss the environment climate change things of those nature for uh, children um and let's talk is, a little bit oh i'm sorry go ahead it's, it is available um, to purchase, um, you know, like an actual book and also via like an ebook, and it's available on Amazon. Okay. Um, let's talk about your kidney advocacy with the NKF and uh, Donate Life. What led you to the decision to become a kidney advocate? Well, so initially when we were kids, when my dad donated to Brian, I saw the impact of transplants. I saw, you know, as a kid that transplants work, they can save lives. And so when I got my driver's license, I knew that I wanted to register as an organ tissue donor. So that was my First, I guess, advocacy is registering as an organ tissue donor on my driver's license. And then getting involved. So I knew that, you know, um, I wanted to be an organ tissue donor. And then, um, you know, I had mentioned that Brian had had um, multiple medical issues. Uh, Brian actually passed away in 2014 and um, primarily from heart failure. Um, but he, he, yes, it, it was multi-organ failure. So he had heart failure, kidney failure. Um, he had blood issues, um, just very, a lot of complications. So um, in the obituary, my dad um, wanted to include 
we, you know, I submitted something to the newspaper about, you know, Brian's passing. And my dad wanted to ensure that he said in lieu of flowers for people to donate to the National Kidney Foundation. Sorry, I'm getting emotional. It, it, it's and okay. Take your time, June. Just the thought of that. I had never even thought about that before. And I had never, I don't even know if I had heard of the National Kidney Foundation before. Um, <clears throat> and I just remember that sticking in my memory, in my mind. And so after Brian passed, you know, of course, I want to keep his memory alive. And, um, uh, you know, this is a way to advocate for Brian and for, you know, people who have kidney disease. And, um, you know, even myself as a living donor, you know, I've lived it. I've seen it. My family has been through it. And so I saw the importance and, you know, just my dad doing that, it just triggered something in me. And I wanted to get involved. And so I initially, um, when I was in Los Angeles, I had um, gotten involved with One Legacy, which is Donate Life um, America, you know, their local chapter. So I got involved with One Legacy and then also there was a, there was an event, a World Kidney Day event, and I got involved in that. And so when I moved back here to Las Vegas, I got involved with Nevada Donor Network, which is the Donate Life, um, you know, local organization. And so I got involved with Donate Life. And then, you know, there was the, the National Kidney Foundation had um, their their annual walks. And so I started getting involved in participating in the walks. So uh, initially just as a walker. And then I got more involved and I was on the walk committee for Las Vegas. And <laughs> then I was a speaker at the, the uh, walk in Las Vegas. And Julie, she is, um, she works for National Kidney Foundation in California. I met Julie and we, you know, were working on the committee together, the walk committee in Las Vegas. And Julie is actually the one who submitted my name and recommended me to partake in the summits in Washington, D.C. And <clears throat> I didn't know what they were, what the involvement was but she submitted my name and recommended me. And so that's how I got involved with, with the National Kidney Foundation more on a national level than just within my local community with the kidney walks. And, uh, you know, passing laws and, you know, saving lives, it's, it's, we have a huge impact by what we're doing and the volunteerism that we do and just meeting other members of the kidney community, uh, you know, like yourself, um, just meeting wonderful people in the community and, um, you know, speaking, you know, our pen is, you know, voices, voices. So we are the voices for those people who don't have a voice or who need the voice and uh, supporting the kidney community and also educating the community in general and educating lawmakers and legislators, because a lot of them don't know, they don't understand. And unless we, like, you know, you'd mentioned, you know, persistence, we have to be persistent, we have to educate them and um, get these law laws passed to save lives and help people. Okay. Talk to us about some of your experiences with conversations with lawmakers. I, I, I noticed there were a number of photographs that that you took this year at the kidney summit of 2023 with the uh, legislators and, and lawmakers uh, talk to me about your experience so i am very fortunate because the lawmakers that i've 
well, most of them, I shouldn't say, not all of them, but um, Congressman Stephen Horsford, now I did not meet with his office this time, but I did at a prior summit. Um, so Congressman um, Stephen Horsford, Jackie Rosen, Catherine Cortez Masto, all three of them have been supportive of the National Kidney Foundation. And all three of them were co-sponsors for the Living Donor Protection Act. So I'm very appreciative, appreciative of the three of them. Um, I have met Congressman Stephen Horsford in person, as well as uh, Catherine Cortez Masto. I have not met Jackie Rosen in person. Um, and um, so I have a feeling that they will all be supportive again. Um, a new one that, yes, a new um, member from Nevada that I met with, uh, the, her staff was the office of Susie Lee. And so I met with her office. Um, I have a feeling that we will get her support as well. Um, in Utah, so I was paired up with, um, you know, volunteers from Utah. So we attended the Nevada meetings and Utah meetings together. Um, Utah, we met with four offices. I believe two of the four do support us. Two of them do not. So uh, we are trying to get the support from Mitt Romney and another office in Utah. And so, you know, it's, it's important to, to get these lawmakers on board. And, um, you know, one of the Utah offices Actually, the staffer they, that we met with was a, a kidney recipient. And so his his legislator legislator does support us. And so I asked him, can you please ask your other representative, you know, legislators in Utah to get on board? Um, and um, so I guess just reaching out to the community and, and networking and just trying to get people on board right now. Uh, Nevada does not have a state living donor protection act. Um, so I know that the national kidney foundation is working on that right now. Uh, it does sound positive and I am hoping that that is passed soon. And I don't know why it wouldn't because what state wants to say that they don't support, you know, someone who wants to be a living kidney donor. At no cost. Right. The bill doesn't have any cost. We, we have the same issue here in Indiana. The, the one thing that attracted me that I that, that caused me to want to do this interview with you, I mean, besides the fact that you were riding around on a camel in, in Egypt, uh -huh. was the, the public service announcement you did for the National Kidney Foundation. Can you tell us a little bit about your experiences with that? With the, the podcast, the online? Yes, ma'am. Yes. So the National Kidney Foundation um, does have volunteers uh, do podcasts similar to what we're doing now. And um, I, I believe they reached out to me and asked me if I was interested in doing um, doing it. And I said, of course, absolutely. And, um, you know, they asked for me to submit some pictures and so I submitted some pictures and then scheduled a time to meet with, with the person who does the video recording, you know, to meet with them. And, um, uh, now it's out on the pub in public. And I, I, I think it's amazing. I think that was the first one I've ever done. And I, Jim, I think this is my second one. And yeah, I don't think I've ever done something like this before. So this is all new for me. But it's exciting to get the word out. And I just, I'm grateful to you and the National Kidney Foundation and, you know, for getting the word out. And this is a great way to do it. And just for allowing me to share my story and to help the public and, you know, help the kidney community. Well, I promise you one thing, June. I'm going to share this all over the place. You know, your Uncle Jim's kind of a social media freak. So, you, you know, your story will be heard, my friend. Great. Thank you for having me. 
Oh, no worries. Before we conclude our discussion for the evening, mm -hmm. is there any statement you would like to make to our audience? Did, did I forget something or is just something that you think is important to say? Um, just, you know, for everyone to be healthy, take care of your kidneys, you know, simple things like don't smoke, um, you know, and, um, you know, try to get some exercise and stay hydrated, drink water. I didn't realize as a kid, I didn't like water. I didn't drink a lot of water. And if I would have known, I would have drank more water, you know, to, to be healthy. And so staying hydrated and um, you know, moderation is key for, you know, for things, you know, whether it's exercise or, you know, what you're eating or drinking. And, um, you know, for the lawmakers, you know, we need your support and help. And, um, you know, the commu kidney community, um, you know, just the wonderful people like you that I've met through the National Kidney Foundation and, and Donate, Donate Life American, all of the things that that we do as volunteers and to, to support the, the kidney community and um, just helping one another be kind, be nice. And um, yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> Register okay. to be a donor. And, you know, uh, that's, that's important. You could do it online. You could do it on your phone. You can uh, register, um, you know, th through your driver's license and, a lot of, you know, um, uh, a lot of people think because they're a kidney recipient or they're not healthy or they're their age that they can't register to be an organ tissue donor. That is not true. That That is a myth. Anyone can register to be an organ tissue donor. Um, they, you know, they obviously do testing to, to ensure, you know, to ensure the tissue or, you know, organ is, you know, um, can be donated, but I just encourage everyone to be an organ tissue donor. Um, you know, it, it's saving lives. And, you know, when you, when you register as an organ tissue donor, I want to, you know, it's, it's not as a living donor, which, you know, is separate. That is, you know, of course, when, when someone passes, then they are an organ tissue donor, but um, don't believe those myths out there. And, most major religions support it. And, um, you know, I know several friends and people who have, um, have had this, their lives saved because someone did register as an organ tissue donor. And, um, so that's, that's really critical and important. Okay. Well, June, I appreciate you coming on so much. Thank you for sharing your story and for yes. educating us, raising a little awareness tonight. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, sign off and uh, end the recording, and uh, then we'll say good night, okay? Thank you so much for having me, Jim. It was great seeing you. Thank you for sharing great. my story. Great seeing you, too. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.